Okay, this is the Dean Zielinski podcast, episode one, series one, just number episode one. Episode one, just Dean number Zielinski. one, yeah. And you're you're Dean Zielinski. I'm Dean Zielinski, so it's all working out. Okay. Most people watching this should hopefully know who you are. This is going to be a guitar and music oriented podcast, but you're Dean Zielinski. That's true. Um, for those of you watching who might not know, Dean Zielinski. Um, founder of Dean Guitars, DBZ Guitars, Dean Zielinski Private Label Guitars, and he's about as ingrained and involved in rock and metal as anyone who's not a band possibly could be. Like, the most iconic headstocks, guitars, record, everyone's heard a Dean-built guitar at some point, which is awesome. That's well, thank you. Yeah. And this is Parker. Parker works at Dean Zelensky guitars and uh, covers a lot of ground. I follow Dean around a lot. <laughs> right. But uh, Parker uh, runs a CNC, programs a CNC, and yes. uh, can do just about anything on the bench. Parker's really responsible for the incredible custom shop stuff, design, uh, but frets. also, but also the fact that every guitar comes out of there with the most incredible action and playability. That was all Parker's uh, implementation. I appreciate so. it. So, and he also uh, does a lot of marketing work. So, uh, Parker's a uh, valuable tool, a va valuable guy at Dean Zielinski Guitars. So, I think we're hanging out here today. We set up all this gear for one for one main talkable reason. Uh, what's going on in Guitar Land? Well, I could show you on the computer, but it's going to blow out, so we'll probably... Uh, I'll put some images in post. In Anyways, yeah. a big night tonight. Yeah. Uh, the... ZZ Top for a guitar, bass, Dusty Habais, sold at auction for $317,500. That's a, that's a very expensive bass. A lot of, <laughs> lot, yeah. You know, no one ever, you don't ever let anyone tell you that Dean guitars don't appreciate. Yeah. I was going to say, I hear a lot about, you know, you see the... Or my guitars, I should say, not Dean guitars. Just, yeah. We guitars. have to clarify all that later, but go on. We'll get into that. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, you hear a lot about, you know, Kurt Cobain and Eddie Van It's like, I don't hear about bass auctions. This is the first bass auction I've heard about in a while. So... Yeah, this this is up... Uh, it, it, it might not be the top selling bass of all time, but it's up there. So, okay... Let's talk about the bass again. Most people should know what it is if they don't. What is what does the bass look like? What is it known for? Let's start with that. Okay, this was the famous ZZ Top spinning for guitars that were in the legs video. And by spinning, they spun. Talk about that. Okay, in the video, uh, they uh, they were attached onto their belt yeah, buckles. Uh, yeah, they're literally belt buckles. They were attached. To, they were casters from a from a from a from a chair. Okay, and the, that was the rig that made them spin. But anyways, the video was very famous. As a matter of fact, 19 whatever year it was, um, the uh, it was the first year that MTV had the video awards. This is when MTV was like rock. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was cool. And um, this was the first year they had the video awards in the video of the year. Every year they voted for the video of the year. And that year, ZZ Top Legs won the video. That's awesome. As a matter of fact, the first four years running... There was a Dean Zielinski, uh, I'm sorry, a Dean guitar in um, the award the, the award winning the winning video. Yeah. Video of the year. Wait, what were the previous years? If you can remember. No, the first year was Easy Top. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. But the next three years, were subsequent a Dean, Dean guitar artists. was in the w video of the year. I think I drank a little. <laughs> um, <laughs> the... Uh, the the, the, video, the video of the year, yeah. there was a Dean guitar in three of the okay, next four Okay, so again, years. for new And that viewers. was the Cars, and uh, uh, that was Robert Palmer, Addicted to Love. Okay, okay, and, okay. And they had three girls, and one of the girls was holding a Dean guitar. Uh, the, the second year was Drive, uh, Cars. Yeah. That was a bass, by the way. So I guess for a guy who made a handful <laughs> of basses in my life, yeah. figured You got a pretty good track record. Yeah, our basses are doing well. Okay. So anyways, that the... the the legs video won the video of the year. Yes, award. and that iconic yeah. bass was right. the bass that sold for three seventeen, three hundred seventeen five. Okay. Besides the fact that it spun, what's the most obvious? Okay, they they were cladded with fur. Okay, so let's talk about the fur. Who come who comes up with a fur bass or okay. fur guitar? Okay, it all started with a three a.m. phone call. Okay. Okay, I'm sleeping, and this was way back in the day on my beautiful luxury Lakeshore Drive apartment. Mm -hmm. downtown chicago what year uh 
80? I don't know. I think it might have been a little later. Okay. Like 82, 83, but I'm not sure. Okay. I can look it up. So anyways, uh, and I get a phone call like at three in the morning from Billy Gibbons. And Gibbons used to call me on a pretty regular basis. You know? Yeah, I want to talk about that, but and carry on. So anyways, he's in, in London, and he's hanging with the guys from Def Leppard. And he calls me up and says, hey, Dean, we got to build these guys some guitars. So at three in the morning, I'm like getting out a pad of paper and working out details of the guitars for the two guys in Def Leppard. Which were brought to you via Billy Gibbons. Yes. <laughs> okay. People don't know this about Billy Gibbons, but he was a literally sharp-dressed man. The guy used to wear like a three-piece suit. He yeah. wanted to be a businessman. Yeah. So he'd wear a three-piece suit. He had charisma. Yeah, he, had, he wore the alligator shoes. He carried a briefcase, and he drove a Mercedes. Yeah. Uh, and which is a whole nother story, but when I met him, it was kind of a trip because he walked out like that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And the first time I met him backstage. And anyways, he in his briefcase, he carried a Dean catalog, and he used to hang with a lot of rock stars and hook, hook them up with, with my guitars. You yeah. Know, he was just a good friend. That's cool. Time. So that was really cool. Anyway, so he worked out the whole, we worked out, you know, the guitars for the two guys in Def Leppard. Mm -hmm. So we I worked out the details of the guitar, and then, you know, at the end of the phone call, he says, oh, by the way, I was just in Scotland. I bought a couple of sheepskins. I'm sending them to you. I want you to put them on some guitars. And I'm like, okay. And I went back to sleep. Yeah, so he's coaxing you with a new band. And then, by the way, here's some fur. Please put it on a guitar. It was just just a side note in, in the conversation. Yeah. And uh, the side note ended up being pretty big. But Anyway, so uh, the Sheepskins showed up in a few days. And uh, Gibbons, you know, we call up. And what do you want to do? And, you know, the guitars ended up with the white fingerboards. So we uh, we built the guitars. And, he's, and then I got a call. Hey, you know, you got to get those to you get those to the studio. You know, they're shipping them to the West Coast because we're doing a video. I'm like, cool, and we finishing them up. In those days, you called the FedEx driver. You know, or, or I mean, it was UPS back in those days. Okay. And the UPS guy's literally standing there while we're gl I'm gluing the fur to the uh, tuners on the two guitars. Right. If you notice, then they all had fur tuners. <laughs> <laughs> and he was waiting. Then we put them in a box, and he took them. And flew them out to the, st the studio on the West Coast. And the next thing you know, their uh, the legs video was coming out. So anyways, it was pretty cool. I mean, the video obviously got huge. Yeah. It was iconic. Those are probably the, it's clearly the most iconic pair of guitars that ever existed. I was gonna, yeah, there's a lot of like iconic individual guitars, but I'm trying to give like paired instruments. And that's got to be, was yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was like 20 something years old. I'm driving down the road. And the DJ was, you know, the song would come on. The DJ was like, "Oh, spin those fur guitars." That's you know, funny. it was like a, it was such a thing. So, how did you adhere that? Was it just glue, or what? How did you get like? Let's talk about the. There's geeks that are going to want to know all about these guitars. Right. So, do you do you remember the specs of the guitars? What models they were? Well, they were full size Z's, which we, was a, the Explorer, and you know, we okay. called them Z's. And uh, you know, Billy Gibbons always wanted the Shimp Fork headstock. Uh, he he was not a fan of the of the V head. Okay. Probably one of the few. Yeah. Which is a whole other story because the V head really took a lot of time to catch on. Right. And there's a lot of, you know, we literally downsized the head three different times okay. over the history of my tenure at Dean Guitars. So, like, debut was bigger than what's current? Yeah, they were stupid huge. Okay. And then they got <laughs> smaller and smaller. And then later everyone was like, oh, well, one with the big head, you know. But right. Yeah. Everyone thinks that the Dean guitar head, like, well, out of the box was... Was like it was. We were fighting a lot of dealers that said, well, "Can you change the headstock?" The headstock had a lot to do with the tone of the guitar, and the okay. bend bendability of the strings, and a bunch of other. Well, yeah, things. yeah. I mean, we we kind of talked about this, but like part of it's spread string tension. Right. Okay. Okay, but that, that's the techie stuff. So, anyways, um, we're a guitar podcast. Come right. on. Okay. <laughs> We're going down a, a what, what were we talking about? Multiple rabbit holes. Um, yeah. We were talking about, well, initially. Um, what became to be known as the Shrimp Fork Headstock. Also, all those ZZ Top guitars with the Shrimp Which, fork. isn't there one with a little bit of fur right there? Yeah. I'll, oh. to, I'll zoom in on that with that camera. Yeah. Actually, how, yeah, we didn't even plan this. <laughs> this thing's just been sitting in my office for, uh, I don't know, 200 years. That's That's amazing. Yeah. This was just something we. Threw together with some extra sheepskin. That's hilarious. By the way, um, thing needs to be dust vacuumed. It's a little yeah. dusty. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. All right, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> so the big the big story tonight is the, the, the base sold for three hundred seventeen thousand right. dollars. Five. Yeah. And the thing is, everyone said you're going to buy it. You're going to buy. It. Everyone thought it was going to go for a hundred grand. Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, the room, the the, the the speculation was around a hundred. I, yeah. I knew it'd go for more. Because. Because of its impact. And also, there's a matching guitar out there, too. Yeah, someday somebody's... Uh, you and know. that guitar is going to go for... But let's face who it. Who even knows? Okay. It's a bass. And bass is... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get some shit for this. But, you know, people... Guitars carry a lot. There's more. just more guitar players than bassists. Yeah, well... Yeah. Yeah. Gibbons... If it was Gibbons for a guitar, it would go for a million dollars. Or more. And it's really a good investment because whoever buys Gibbons guitar is going to pay in excess of a million dollars for it if it ever goes to auction. Mm-hmm. And whoever buys a guitar for a million dollars probably has got a few bucks. And yeah. he's going to want the, the pair. So it's probably a good investment. Did they it. announce who bought it? It's only been minutes. I don't know. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I mean, plus, we're doing a podcast, so I didn't really get the chance. To we'll see. follow up on that on round two. Right. Okay. It's it's pretty cool that one of my guitars holds for 317 Yeah. Five. So, okay, like I've seen some threads and stuff talking about the bass. Like, so h- how involved with the ZZ Top were you prior to even making them the fur guitars? Okay, well, the Billy Gibbons story is kind of big. Uh, we had a mutual friend who hooked us up, a okay. guy named Tony Dukes. So you, got, you know, he, he lo- Dukes loved my guitars. He said, you, got, you and Billy got to talk. So he, he's always trying to hook us up. And somehow, you know, Billy and I just ended up on the phone. He would call me on a pretty regular basis Yeah, and just talk talk shop finally one day i said let me build you a guitar so i built him an ml mm-hmm. with the real you stuff. built billy gibbons an ml yeah by the way before before dimebag daryl <laughs> yeah played the ml and made it famous yeah i had kansas playing the mls right. i had um the guy in the doobie brothers john mcphee playing mls mm-hmm. M- mls was becoming like the rock guitar yeah Daryl's the guy who pulled it all the way metal, and then right. there was no coming back. I but. started playing guitar when I was like 12, which would have been like 2002 or three. And every time I saw an ML, it was like pr- dime, and then later like trivia. Like I always right. thought it was like a metal guitar, but to right. think of Dimebag, or not Dimebag, Billy playing an ML, right? that's that's sick. Well, he never played it live. He recorded the Eliminator record with it. That was the rec- that was the studio guitar. That that whole album was recorded with recorded with uh, with an ML. That's right? awesome. And it was verified by his manager. I mean, Billy said, you know, his manager yeah. said, hey, and, and we'll talk about that story another time. Okay. It's when I got left in the middle of a farm in in uh, somewhere in Florida. And my yep. only, don't my, know this one. My only ride home was a limo ride with Billy Gibbs' manager. So anyway, so I shipped him the ML. Mm-hmm. And all I got back was a letter. I still have it. And it says, hey, you know, thanks for a uh, handwritten guitar. letter. It was tight, but, I, you know, yeah, yeah. but it, it was very Texas and very Gibbons. Okay. And he's like, thanks. I can't wait to give it a few whacks. <laughs> it, was, it sure is a pretty thing. Yeah. You know, and all the slang, which was typed into the letter. Anyways, I could show it to you. But anyways, long story short, uh, then we just talked and stuff and, Next thing I know, he's calling the he's, he's making the Eliminator record, and he calls me up and he says, "Man, this guitar sounds so great. We used it on the whole album. Well, you got to come, you got to come, you know, hear this record." Okay. So I was in L.A. when I got the phone call, which is kind of hard because I don't remember how we got phone calls out of town yeah, before what, cell phones. I was gonna say, what were you even doing in L.A. at that point? I was just, I know, I know, I don't know what I was doing there, but I was hanging in L.A. Yeah. And then I get a call from Gil, Gibbons, and I rerouted, you know, I said, okay, I'll stop in Houston on my way home. Okay. Stopped in Houston. He picked me up in his little SL Mercedes, and on the way back from the airport, I listened to the whole Eliminator record. <laughs> so you were one of the first beta testers. <laughs> right, and it was before it was before the fair, like, all the sequencing was in, so I heard legs in its raw form before they put in all so the... Just- Drums, keyboard, bass, guitar, vocals. Yeah, I thought it was great. Yeah, I didn't like the sequencing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's what it's known for, right? But there's a story behind all that. Okay. And if you watch the the documentary on ZZ Top, it's kind of revealed that you know Gibbons is kind of pissed because not pissed, but nobody danced to um, to uh, ZZ Top music. He was he was the band. Like I said, they always kind of split up and then got back together, split up and got and they, so. So during the hiatus, he was hanging a lot in, in England, and he was go- going to a lot of the clubs. Right. 
And like I knew Gibbons at the time and I was hanging with him and we were talking a lot, but I didn't really realize. And I got, I was the recipient of a lot of the stuff because he's, but I didn't realize he was literally orchestrating this record as a, you know, as a whole different thing because he was pissed that nobody would, he'd be in the clubs yeah. and nobody was dancing to ZZ Top. Yeah. Either they were playing it. Got some like dan- right. dance envy. Yeah. Right. So, anyways, <laughs> he's like, I want to do. So, he, the Eliminator record was totally orchestrated so people can dance. Mm-hmm. And that, well, he got, he, got a, he got a fair light. I don't know if they gave it to him or whatever, but he was one of the first guys on earth to have a fair light. And a fair light was the first sequencing computer. Mm-hmm. I mean, for sequencing keyboard. Keyboard, yeah. When they cost $50,000. Jesus. And, you know, a few months later, they're all on the market for five, six hundred bucks. And, Eddie Van Halen to jump with it, you know, and everything. Yeah. That's a whole other story because that was almost the, yeah. the demise of Dean Guitars was, was <laughs> Eddie, Eddie Van Halen. Eddie Van Halen <laughs> and that one song, Jump, you know. Huh. But anyway, because uh, when you when he came out playing keyboards, you couldn't sell a guitar. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, a, it was, and that's pe- people won't understand why, but when you sell guitars, there's two sells. Mm. You got to sell the music store, which, by the way, we don't do anymore. But you got to sell the music store, then the then you then you have to sell the consumer. Yeah. And if the music store isn't buying, it doesn't matter how how good your guitars are, how many consumers want it. If the music store doesn't buy, you can't sell. Right. And when keyboards were hot, it was like you'd call up a dealer and say, "Hey, uh, you want any guitars?" They said, "No." You got any keyboards? And then they hang up. That's crazy to me. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. Like obviously, like I know all those hits and stuff, but to think of Eddie Van Halen as a keyboard driving salesman that doesn't register at all in my brain but yeah. but yeah. you got to put yourself into that headspace well and, you know when people get shoes everybody wants the same shoes right yeah okay or some new shoe blah 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 so he's playing keyboards everybody oh we got a band we need we need a sequencing it was a sequencing this is really for an, a, a, a much bigger story but yeah when when jump came out and eddie van halen the world's greatest guitar player was playing Keyboards. keyboards it hurt guitar sales <laughs> virtually almost killed guitar sales that's crazy yeah uh, so you know people people don't understand like a lot of stuff with guitar business you know you have to sell the music stores before you sell the consumers mm. back in the day there was floor planning there were all sorts of obstacles that when you're a 19 year old kid like i wasn't going into the guitar business you didn't know about yeah all right, I, I, I'm gonna rope us back in for a sec. This, yeah. this has been the longest tangent of all time. Oh yeah, okay. cool. But so back to the base, right. <laughs> which started today. Um, so, so you'd known the band at that point. Yeah. You and Billy were pretty tight. Were you yeah. tight with the rest of the band, or was you- no? It's it's really cool because I mean, not cool, but you know, they weren't tight. You know, yeah. So it wasn't, and but I would show up mm-hmm. like for a, a concert show or something like that. And yeah. Dusty, Dusty was always very, very polite. And, and, hey, Dean, I love that bass. I love it. But, but Billy was the band. I mean, sure. he was the dude. He orchestrated. Well, every a, band is like a yeah. But he figurehead. he orchestrated everything. He, um, you know, it was it was it was his genius. Okay. And uh, so, like I said, when when he said we're doing this, you know, we we we're doing fur basses. Dusty plays a fur bass. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when on the. I made um, for the Eliminator tour. The first first guitars we made were like Explorer shape. Mm-hmm. Gibbons calls me up and says, "Yeah, I want these. I mean, can you make them with uh, with a UV, with a fluorescent paint?" Mm-hmm. I'm like, "Yeah, no problem." He goes, "I want them red, and, you know." And uh, he says, "We're going to put UV lights." I was going to say, "Yeah, so UV, yeah, UV guitars and ZZ Top." Right. So they, they put UV lights in, in the spots. Mm-hmm. And so from a million miles away, they're shooting UV lighting, which is black. And yeah. But when it hits the floor, I think the tires was lighting up and all you'd see is these, like, it'd be like, you know, dark, you know, lights out on stage between songs. Right. And all you'd see is these guys, like, red guitars and these, <laughs> that was lighting up their beards. It was really cool. Yeah, like, on paper, that sounds like such a, like, Kesha thing. Like, were, were there other bands doing that type no, of stuff? No, no, no. Gibbons wasn't in it. So ZZ Top started rave guitar <laughs> yeah i mean gibbons was cool I mean, yeah you know he was an innovator he was he was very like cutting edge That's and cool. by the way zz top could have gone kind of into obscurity kind of like you know kind of like 
like one hit wondery. Well, they were they were they were big, okay. Yeah. But but if you didn't make a, a shift, a paradigm shift, like a reinvention. Yeah, a reinvention. You were like like Ted Nugent. Okay. okay. Ted Nugent's heyday was way back when. Okay, and mm. it's kind of like yeah, Ted Nugent could do his own stuff. Gibbons came out with a new sound, a new look, yeah. and huge hit. Well, well, like you know, like bands have eras, em- or embraced, they, some do. Yeah, embraced uh, embraced MTV in the video era. Okay, mm-hmm. I mean the guys that didn't get that fell 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 to the wayside. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even like bands like um, Def Leppard, they played my guitars. Yeah, but because I, of Billy Gibbons, <laughs> probably not. Actually, no. I I I hooked up. Uh, that's a cool story because I hooked up the guitar player who replaced Jeff Baxter. But they went through a lot of renditions, okay? Uh, Def, uh, Doobie Brothers. Yeah, you said Def Leppard. I was like, what? No, Doobie Brothers <laughs> went through yeah, a Baxter, lot. Baxter, the best I know, never played Def Leppard, but continuing. Skunk Baxter, you know, yeah. he had a bad back and he had to sit down and then eventually, you know, he, he you know, he, he quit the band. Okay. And John McPhee took his place. Mm-hmm. And John McPhee, by the way, was the drummer's landscaper. But... Uh, <laughs> But, and part of a band called Clover, which is that's a, some right place, right time shit right there. Well, yeah, I mean, he was just hanging in the wings, but yeah, you know, to make a living, he was la- doing landscaping. Okay. So, anyways, he ends up in the band, but I had hooked him up with a with an ML when he was in the band Clover. And by the way, you'll never guess who the singer was in Clover. I'm gonna know it when you say it. Uh, it was, Clover never really made it. I mean, it was obscure. Okay. But they broke up and. The guitar player, John McPhee, ended up in the Doobie Brothers like months later. Mm-hmm. And the singer was Huey Lewis. No way. Yeah. That's awesome. It was huge. I'm a huge Huey Lewis but, fan. <laughs> but, but they were around for 10 years as Clover and they couldn't put it together and they break up and then they hit, you know, these guys. So, anyways, back to the Doobie Brothers. Mm-hmm. Um, John McPhee, I mean, they reinvented themselves. They got Michael McDonald. Yeah. And then they had this huge hit, and they were they they were in the Grammy. They won five Grammys one year, and uh, they were in the Grammy Awards. And, mm. John Mc, and my my guitar was right John McPhee. Was, John McPhee was playing a really cool Cadillac. I was gonna say what what model? It was a Cadillac, Cadillac. Okay. and the thing is, the, the head was so big. Yeah, because like Gen One, right? Okay, yeah, and he's like kind of in the foreground, and they got Michael McDonald in the back, kind of like on the yeah. keyboard. Well, they got the headstock like brightening the whole time. Yeah, and McDonald. <laughs> You know, the camera's just zooming on this guy because he's the star and he, you know, he yeah. probably wrote, mm-hmm. I'm guessing he wrote the song. He's, sing, he's singing the song. Well, and they for, keep, what, for What a Fool Believes? Yeah, What a Fool Believes. Okay. And every time they're zooming in, they got to get by the Dean Headstock. It was like the biggest moment of average. I'm like 20 something years old. I'm yeah. watching the Grammys and my headstock's like filling up my <laughs> my 25 inch TV or whatever. It's the biggest TV you could buy at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. Okay, so here's a question. So you're talking about hanging out with ZZ Top right. and you know all these bands. How common was it at that time for other, you know, owners of guitar companies to to interact with bands in that fashion? Because you were, I mean, as far as I know, like when you started Dean Guitars, you were young. Like, was like Leo Fender out there rocking side stage to the Beach Boys or like I don't know. Okay, we were the second generation. Okay, there was Fender Gibson. And, yeah, you know those Bram Rickenbacker. Or whatever, I was gonna say, but like you and like you know right. what else was going on in that time? And then Gibson was sold to Norlin, and Fender was sold to CBS, and no, but you know they were just out of touch, making you know, all the stuff. Some of the stuff is kind of sought after now, but at the time, no, everybody was looking for a 1950s, 1960s. Yeah, Gibson but like so, you 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 started in seventy. 70- Eight seventy six. I I started building a factory. When did you sell your first Dean guitar? January seventy seven. Okay, so basically, well, I took my first orders January seven. I, I sold yeah. my first guitar in because I was going to say like the eighties aren't necessarily known as being like a great year for a lot of manufacturers, right? Other than you, like so, what what were those brands doing to connect with artists? If at all, so we were all we're all the new generation. Okay, yeah, we yeah. all went to the Nam Show in 1977. Okay, the Winter Nam Show it was okay. new out in L.A. The Nam Show was always in Chicago before. Okay, okay, big summer Nam. The Winter Nam was the first year. Part of a much longer story, but <laughs> my marketing guy at the time says we got to go to Nam. When I first started, I hadn't shipped a guitar yet. Anyway, so we ended up going to Nam in Anaheim, California, 
And I met guys like uh, Seymour Duncan. Mm -hmm. I met, uh, I think, Wayne Charvel. Yeah. I met a guy named Bernie Rico. You don't understand that, like, coming from a guy. I already knew Larry DiMarzio because I was putting his pickups in my guitars. Yeah. Working with him in the rear, in the, um, in the repair days. Yeah. But we all, okay. And like 20 years, 30, 40 years later, we all realized that was our first NAMM show. <laughs> all yeah. of us. So it was like this thing was happening. <laughs> Did you all like party and rage and shit? Or like. <laughs> well, we had a huge party at NAMM. Okay. We, uh, yeah, I had a huge. <laughs> it was all in the Disneyland Hotel and we literally. Destroyed it. Well, we moved a big. We. We got a three room suite and we we said we're having a party. Yeah. And we took the are we going down this tan anyways, we, we, <laughs> we put we put the beds up against the walls, had this huge party, had a live rock band in there. In the in the room in the hotel. Who was in the band? We Any- had, I mean the only guy I really remember well, it was the only guy rock star I remember was uh uh the guy from uh the guy from uh, Starship, uh, Craig Chikiso. Okay. And there might have been some, you know, like, there might have been some other rock stars there, but it was, like, so long ago, and I was so young, I might have even not even known, but it was a big jam. Yeah. That's nuts. Yeah, the party got busted. <laughs> the, 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 like, from from my hotel room, it's all like the way down to house the, of- all the way down to the elevator, yeah. people were the party was just going. I mean, I bought all this liquor and stuff. Someone needs to make a movie out of yeah. this concept. I was like... 19 years old. Mm-hmm. Anyways, the hotel security comes up to bust the party. And like, okay, you got to know that I kind of always look young my whole age, my whole life. Right. So when I was 19, I kind of looked 16, 16 yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So the security comes up and says, whose party is this? And I stepped up. I said, it's mine. And they just looked at me and said, whose party is this? Yeah. So I just walked out the door. That's amazing. And I went up to the bar and I was drinking, I think at 16 years old, in the hotel bar. While this you mean whole, 19? I mean 19. Fake 16, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, yeah, I was 19. Yeah. Yeah, Anyways, yeah. I was drinking in the bar while this whole party was going getting busted in my hotel room. I think we started it up a couple of times. Okay. Yeah. Before they, before they just shut us down. But anyways, that was that was my first NAM show. Right. So my point but, was, what other heads of guitar companies were doing anything even so remotely my, similar? My point is, okay, Hamer was another company, mm-hmm. okay? And little known fact, or maybe it's known to some people, but Paul Hamer was my guitar teacher when I was 12 years old, that's 13 a, years old. quite the factoid. Right. And we both ended up in the guitar manufacturing. That's, that's, a, that's a podcast topic there. Okay. But anyway, so like when you're like starting guitars we had like a couple of things you know you had these lanes going you were competing to get the retailers okay okay so you would like you know you're trying to get sam you're trying to get in all the stores you know mm-hmm. like back then sam ash was the big by the way sam ash was the first dealer to buy a dean guitar that's cool my first dealer was sam ash music which was the largest at the time they were bigger than guitar center yeah the first guitar ever sold was to a rock star it was Kerry living of kansas that's not a bad first sale yeah so <laughs> I don't know if I got lucky or if I'm yeah. really if I was good, but yeah, those were my first two first retailer, first guitar I sold was to Carrie Livgren. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway, so we had different lanes. So when you're and you're working all these lanes all the time, but the first lane was you're trying to get in the music stores, right? Mm-hmm. And you're competing against all the other brands to get shelf space in the music stores. The other lane you're working all the time was rock stars. I'd spent my whole time backstage networking and stuff and getting rock stars. But when I'd go back there, there'd be like Hamer guys would be, because we're in Chicago, you know, the Hamer guys would be there, you know? All right. And it was probably a lot of awkward for a lot of the bands, but, you know, we're trying to get, you know, get Hamer. I mean, we're trying to get ba- guitars to bands and then my competitors would be backstage. All right. One time I was talking, I forgot, I think it was Neil Sean. I was playing the, I think, Soldier Field. And I'm sitting there talking to him, and everything's going good. Then someone comes up and talks to him. Oh, BC Rich is here, and they're going to give you four or five guitars oh, or something. Geez. He was gone. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So that was that was another lane, you know. And Neil Schoen never played my guitars. Snatch. Yeah. So I mean, I was sat there with Eddie Van Halen when he was like nobody hardly knew him. Wait, what? Yeah. When? <laughs> <laughs> Decades ago. Yeah. It's weird because I, he was playing the the uh, Aragon Ballroom, which is a mm. 
kind of a starter venue for, but it's big, you know, I mean, it was like Aragon was, but everybody, all the rock bands started out in the Aragon. And uh, I was talking, but I don't think this was at the Aragon show, but I used to have the backstage, tel- you know, everything back then was pay phones, but I had the, no- the number of the pay phone backstage of Aragon. So I would, if Eddie Van Halen was there, I'd call and just ring the phone and somebody would answer. All right. Yeah, but he was like, nobody, like, he, we're in Chicago. We didn't know. I think you told me one time that the first time you heard him, someone was at a gig and he was sound checking. Is this that true? That was it. I called okay. the phone. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't, I got some, some guy named Van Halen. I, I mean, it was like the like a name of a bug or something at the time. I didn't, okay. I didn't know who Van Halen was. But, you know, I'm listening on the phone and he was sound checking. And you're hearing, you know, and I'm hearing all guitar that. playing like I never heard before. And yeah, like, God, oh, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. So, anyways, I think he was playing the Chicago Amphitheater when I finally met him. Okay. But once again, I'm sitting there um, having a meeting with him. I opened up an ML case. Mm-hmm. He takes one look at it and says, oh, I don't want that. That dude in the, uh, in the cars plays that, which was LED. Yeah. yeah. Huh. And like, I'm like, and then somebody came and whispered something in his ear, and he was gone. And I'm sitting there waiting around, and then I just said, "Fuck it, I split." Right. So I don't know if they were offering him blow or chicks or <laughs> who knows what, but uh, yeah, that was my first encounter with Eddie Van Halen. Huh. So. I'm trying. I'm trying to be the the grounding man here, but again, we we so many tangents from a dusty hill base. <laughs> right. We should okay. call this the Dean Zelensky tangent well, podcast. There's there's a lot of stories, and I can elaborate on yeah. them, but it's like a lot of connected. A lot of connective tissue here. Yeah. I mean, right. it's a whole genre of music. It's super impactful. You've been involved with every band, like effectively right. I- impactful bands and artists. That's. But I did, I'm in my young 20s, mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time, I, you know, I'd go to a lot of shows. Yeah, you were, of, you were at, and, involved. Yeah. And when the, get, and when the, get, when the, like the, see those days, music's way different today. Mm-hmm. But in those days, you had two or three radio stations in every major town. Mm. They had one or two venues, three venues. And and rock was kind of narrow. Yeah. Okay. And you could and bands were playing arenas. And I was selling guitars to arena bands right, right out of the gate. Yeah. So when you'd see a band like playing a you know, arenas were like, you know, United Center. Well United Center wasn't there, yeah. but All Star Are- All State Arena, whatever they were called back in the day. The Chicago Amphitheater. You'd go to see the big band because I had like heart. I'd have the, you know, I'd go to, I'd get invited because I'm making guitars for heart. Sure. So when heart's on stage, what am I doing? I'm selling best, guitars. Yeah. I'm working the opener because <laughs> yeah. they just got off stage and they want to see all the cool and guitars. And they're probably going to turn into a huge band that right. we all know There's now. There's a yeah. good shot that those guys are going to yeah. be headliners someday. Okay. Do you, off the top of your head? So you're working the two and three bands while the one, the your yeah. your buddies are on stage. And then when they get off stage, you have to say lie to them and say, "Yeah, you guys were great," <laughs> <laughs> or "I loved something," or you'd go out there long enough to be able to, to or maybe they were great, you know. No, but I'm just saying yeah, you no. get out there long enough to, uh, to so you'd have something you could relay back to them. And but I was backstage hosting. So I, really quick, and then we should probably right. cut. We're, we've been on the long one. We got we have like 50 topics that we're going to start on probably immediately tomorrow. All right. You said that you would try and like you know cook the younger bands or vice versa. Were there any like younger up and coming support bands that you had met while you were there specifically to see a headliner that you already knew? Well, I think there were some times where I would I would know the opener was coming. We always keep in mind you couldn't like there was no internet, no yeah. nothing. Okay, so if a band's coming to Chicago. Just a band in general? Big band, whatever, yeah. okay, okay. How do you call them? Okay. <laughs> yeah, you got no Facebook, no Instagram, <laughs> no, whatever. Nothing, yeah. Yeah. So you go and you buy the record, and you call the record company, you call the management office, and you do all, you know. Yeah. And that's what I did. I'm like okay. Dean Zelinsky from Dean, and, you know, a lot of people didn't know who I was. But if you said, you know, you get, you made guitars and you wanted to talk to a specific, you know, you know Nancy Wilson or whatever and Hart. Yeah. Sometimes you get entree, you know, they'd yeah. say, or they get to her and they, she knew about my brand, you know, they would get the message mm-hmm. and then you would get the call. Yeah, you can, you know, your passes will be blah, blah, blah. Right. You know, so 
And then if the opening act was, if I knew who they were and they were meaningful, yeah, yeah I'd work that record too. All right. So that was like, you know, we, you know, we were basically calling, I mean, I was calling record companies and everyone you could find on the back of that album cover, you yeah. know, 411 was, was our biggest friend back in the day. I think, um, which was 555-1212 with any area code. <laughs> You're you know, if it was your LA, age, if it was LA, it was 312-555-1212 and you'd get the LA 411 and that's how you'd call the record company or 212 if it was New York. So on that note, I think we should, uh, well, first off, episode one, pretty good. Talking a lot about stuff. Not you know. bad. I think you're going to have to employ your phone call skills and get some of these people in that also have insider information or direct Dean Zelinsky contact. And yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll have phone and phone in. Colors. We should do some phone ins. You know, yeah. you got a Rolodex that's like the most impressive thing I've ever seen in my life. Well, thank you. So I don't know if all the numbers are good. We'll find out. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, outro's on you, man. Outro's on me. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for listening. This is cool and. Uh, just the beginning of uh, a lot of stories.